Thank you for joining our study again today. Last week, as I closed out our lesson, I was talking to you about the first chapter of the book of Romans, and specifically, we were looking at verses 16 and 17 of that first chapter. I, I, I'm really encouraged by those first words, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God for salvation. You know, those are big words, and those are exciting words, and those are encouraging words. But just two verses down in verse 18, where we pick up today, we find that the Apostle Paul is suddenly changing the subject. He is actually talking uh, in these passages of Scripture about the wrath of God. And you know, any time we consider the wrath of God, it uh, entails his judgment. It entails his judgment. And why would God ever get angry? Well, he gets angry over our disobedience. He gets angry over our rebellion. He gets angry whenever we choose a lifestyle other than the lifestyle he created for us. Now, today we're actually going to be looking at what I consider to be the saddest passage of Scripture in the book of Romans. It is not necessarily difficult to translate for you. It's not necessarily difficult to teach it to you because this is one of those passages of Scriptures that God has made very, very plain through the writings of the Apostle Paul. And you know, there are so many people that have difficulty uh, understanding the Bible. And most of the people who have difficulty understanding the Scriptures uh, do not read the Bible regularly. However, even if you read the Bible occasionally, the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today it goes against much of our culture today. However, the words could not be more clear. The words are very, very plain. Now, let me ask you a question, though. Why would Paul, at the very beginning of this book, when he wanted to get his readers' attention, why would he begin with the subject so sad as the wrath of God? Why would he begin talking about the wrath of God and associating that wrath with the judgment of God? Well, the only thing that, that I can figure is that perhaps Paul was preparing his readers regarding God's judgment so that they could better understand the provision of God's grace. I hope that makes sense to you. In this passage of Scripture, God, through the Apostle Paul, is helping the people to understand what makes God angry, what makes God mad, what evokes God's judgment. And in so doing, it, it gives us a better understanding of His provision of grace as we look through the following chapters uh, that will come up because much will be said about grace and we will be taught very much about law and grace. And so we need to remember this as we move through these verses and these passages together. So as we do that, let's do that by beginning with verse number 18 we're going to read down probably through verse 21. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of people. So what is it that stirs God's anger up? Godlessness. A life that excludes God. So, the wrath of God is revealed against all, uh, against all godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, in just a little while, we're going to talk uh, uh, about that age-old debate uh, relative to eternal security, uh, once in grace, always in grace. Can you ever lose your salvation? Can you give up your salvation? Can you uh, lose your salvation and then get it back again? You know, so many questions that have been debated for centuries, and hopefully, before we conclude this lesson, we are going to answer a few of these. But once again, as we look and consider the wrath of God, which always evokes the judgment of God, the wrath of God is revealed to who? Well, first of all, again, it's revealed to those who practice godlessness, those who intentionally live their lives without God. And in this passage of Scripture, I believe that Paul is referring to people who once made a profession that they knew God. So they made a profession that they knew God, and they claimed to be Christians. And, and so, but yet the Bible says that through their lifestyle, they suppressed the truth. So what is the type of ungodliness that really angers God? Whenever you do things as a professed Christian and you are suppressing the truth, you're saying, ah, oh, you know what? The truth of God's word, it doesn't apply here. No, 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 no. Things have changed. It used to apply, but it doesn't really anymore. But you know, that angers God whenever we take his eternal truth, uh, that truth that was true in the days of Adam and Eve, that truth that was in the days of Noah, that truth that was in the days of Abraham and Moses and Elijah, King David, that truth that was true in the days of Jesus and the disciples, and that truth that was true in the days of the Apostle Paul and the early church, and that truth that is still true today. God's word has not changed. I want to remind you, as I've quoted recently quite a bit, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says, The grass may wither and the flower may fade, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. It will be true forevermore. And so God's, God is angered whenever we suppress the truth. He goes on in verse 20, Paul does, and he says, God has made his words so plain that we are without excuse. Now, I've seen this in my own children. Back when my kids were little, and I've even seen this in my grandchildren as they deal with their own parents. Have you ever noticed that a parent can give a child uh, very detailed instructions? And sometimes that child only hears what he wants to hear. Sometimes that child only does what he wants to do. And the parent many times will come back and say, didn't I tell you? So there have been instructions that we as parents uh, have made to our children that were very clear. They were so painfully clear that our kids were without excuse whenever they only followed part of those instructions. 
God has made his intentions for us very, very clear. And so we are without excuse when we try to suppress the truth and alter that that God has described. Now something else that evokes the wrath of God is those who refuse to glorify God, to acknowledge Him as God, and to be thankful for all of God's provisions. You know, uh, we, in our generation today, we have the mentality that uh, everything is mine, mine, mine. But as Christians, we have to remember that anything that is ours to enjoy here on earth, it is ours because ultimately God has provided for everything. God has enabled you to acquire what you have acquired. God has even given you abilities and skills to help you earn the living that you have earned. And so whenever we are so intent to say that it's mine, 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 uh, we are showing the example of an ungrateful heart. We are not acknowledging and glorifying God for what he has provided for us, and neither are we thankful. So this poses a huge, huge question right now. A question that we're going to use as we move on in the remainder of our scriptures. I want you to think about it just for a minute. When will God give up on you? Well, the immediate response, based on several other verses of Scripture in other passages throughout the Bible, the immediate re response is never. God will never give up on you. But here in Hebrews chapter, I mean in Romans chapter 1, we're going to read about the only exception to that rule. The only exception. And in reality, God doesn't give up on you. Remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 10 verse 28? Jesus said, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, whenever you become a child of God, God's protection is with you. And there is only one thing that would ever cause God to give up on you. And that is, if you give up on God to the point that you don't want him to be your God anymore. That you don't want to retain him in your knowledge. As General Baptist, we believe that uh, it is possible to know the heavenly gifts of God, to have tasted uh, salvation, to know Jesus Christ is our Lord. And yet, if we fall away, now, if we fall away, if we turn away, if we reject all of that, the scripture says that it's now impossible in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, it says it's impossible to come back. Now, here's what I want you to understand about all of this. I believe that whenever I was saved, at age seven, that was a lot of years ago. Matter of fact, it was over 50 years ago. It was over 55 years ago. Whenever I was saved, 55 years ago, in another month, it'll be 65. Uh, I'm sorry, 56. Whenever I was saved, 55 years ago, my soul, I believe, has been secure ever since then. Now, I have sinned a lot since then. 
I can even recall patterns of sin in my life to where God felt so far away. But I never got to the point in my backsliding that I gave up on God. And so God never gave up on me. He wooed me back to him. He brought me back to him. But, Paul is clearly writing to believers here. And he talks about people who once had a profession of faith and how uh, they got to the point that they went so far, they didn't even want to think about God anymore. Let's look and see what it says about them. It says, I'm going to read verse 21 again. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor they gave thanks to, nor did they give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. In other words, it wasn't about God. And their foolish hearts were darkened. So if they were darkened, it means that their minds were drawn to the dark things of the world. And it says, And although they claimed to be wise, they still claimed to be people of faith, they still claim to be Christians. They eventually became fools, and they willfully exchanged the glory of the, of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So they got to the point that they worshipped creation instead of the Creator, even to the point of worshipping themselves instead of the Creator. Then it says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful, des de sinful desires of their hearts. I like the way the King James Version puts it. God gave them up. So they were hell-bent to do their own thing. They were hell-bent to worship creation rather than the Creator. They were hell-bent to uh, worship themselves or to put themselves first instead of God first. And so the Bible says that they began following their various evil desires. Uh, it says, first of all, many of them turned to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, verse 26 says, God gave them over to shameful lust. Now I want to stop here just for a moment. I want you to understand where one sin will lead you. Let's say that uh, as a child, you developed, uh, maybe even as a teenager, a, a habit of lying. If that habit is not brought in check, you will begin to even broaden those boundaries. You'll not only lie, you'll deceive. You'll use lying and deception uh, to feed your greed. You may even use lying to then feed your newfound lust. So you see, one sin will lead to another, and sometimes it will even lead you to a different type of sin. And, and, and so we need to understand that. And, and one sin leads to another. And notice uh, how Paul gets so detailed. He said it even got to the point in verse 26 that even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. So this, talk, this is talking about women who began desiring other women sexually. Then it goes on in verse 27 and it says, And in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Now, anytime the Bible uses the word lust, it is never in a positive way. It is never in a positive light. So as a result of that, Paul is condemning these actions, these uh, desires of homosexuality, women for women, men with men.
And it goes on to say that men committed shameful acts with other men, and they received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, I want you to understand that we think that these type of sins are, are something that's just newer to the last couple of generations here in the uh, early uh, 2000s and then also in the 1900s. But, but that's not the case at all. Matter of fact, many of the Caesars had uh, issues and problems with all sorts of sexual perversions. It was uh, documented by many of the historians of the early, earlier days. Now notice what it says in verse 28. It says, furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Uh, the King James Version says God gave them up to a reprobate mind and, and so that they might do what ought not to be done. And it says they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Does that sound like people who are heaven bound? It doesn't. It doesn't. It goes on, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters. Will a God-hater ever make it into the throne of heaven? No. They are insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They're not satisfied with the original ways. They keep trying to find more ways to pervert the truth. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous degree, decree. So it's people who know what God's word says, and yet they're choosing another alternative. They know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Now, before I close today, I, I just want to resurface something that I've already talked about. You know, I shared with you that I believe that my soul has been secure since I was saved at age seven. And General Baptist, many of them preached early on that uh, I remember growing up hearing preachers preach and they talk about getting saved again. And ladies and gentlemen, the scripture is clear that we are saved once. We are converted once. And God will not give up on you unless you give up on him and you say, God, I know I chose you years ago whenever I was age seven, but I don't want you anymore. I don't want to retain you in my knowledge. I realize that some of our other Baptist friends, some of our Southern Baptist friends will say, well, they were never really saved uh, in the first place. But our General Baptist doctrine, uh, it, it teaches uh, that, that we believe that... Uh, there is a salvation to preserve. That yes, we were sealed unto the day of redemption, uh, which the book of Ephesians said, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And it is true that no outside force can pluck you out of the Father's hand. I've already quoted John 10, verses 28 and 29. However, writers like James, in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he says, brothers, so if he calls them brothers, he's calling them Christians, right? He says, brothers, if any of you wander from the truth and someone converts him, let him know that he who has converted the sinner from the error of his way shall cover a multitude of sins and save a soul from death. So notice, he begins by calling him brother. And he said, but let him know that if someone brings him back, he has converted a sinner from the error of his ways and has saved a soul from death. So the same person that was called a brother is now referred to as a soul who was saved from eternal death. So James was pretty clear, and this was our Lord's brother. 
Also, Jesus, whenever he spoke to Judas about his betrayal, he told Judas it would have been better for him had he never been born. Now, I cannot fathom in my mind that God would give us an example of somebody not deserving to be in ministry. To call a disciple in ministry who didn't deserve to be called. And yet Jesus said it would have been better had you not been born. That tells me that Judas had forsaken the salvation he had received. That's my interpretation of it. That's what I believe. I don't believe you can be saved more than once. And I believe that even though you may have had a season of backsliding, if there's this pulling in your heart of our Lord drawing you back, then he's not given up on you because you've not given up on him. You know, God will let you go where you choose to go. But he sent his son to die on a cross for your sins. And the salvation that you have received through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, it will keep you and it will preserve you. We as Christians, we will make mistakes. There were times that I believe that after becoming a follower of Christ that many of the disciples sinned. Many of the disciples inappropriately showed their emotions or their anger. So we know that it is possible for somebody who was just intently filled with the Spirit of God, we know it's possible for them to still sin, for them to still show greed, for them to still show, show selfishness. But by the same token, the true believer of God, if he has truly been saved, that individual will feel that uh, Spirit drawing them back attempting to restore that fellowship between them and God. And as long as we hold on to that hope, even though we may have made a mistake here and there, God will not give up on us. I hope that this lesson today has enlightened you in a special way. Thank you for sharing it with me. God bless you.